All right, everyone, we're going to get started now. Um, so we're going to finish up unit four today. Um, until now, we've focused on some of the practical ideas about feature selection, and now we're going to think about things in a slightly more theoretical way that's going to help us move forward with um, the rest of the uh, semester. So the main idea here is that machine learning is really about estimating statistical parameters in a probabilistic model of the data. So we have been doing this, although we haven't been talking about it in those terms. So, um, so in, this, in this lecture, we're going to talk about two particular estimation approaches. Um, one is maximum likelihood. The other is maximum a posteriori, or in other words, MAP estimation. Two approaches um, to do that parameter estimation. And we're going to essentially see that um, least squares can be thought of as a maximum likelihood approach. We'll also see that ridge regression and lasso can be seen as maximum, as map approaches. And then when we move to um, classification in the next unit, we might start that today, we're going to really need to rely on this because we won't have any other way to proceed. So, um, so just as a background, let's... Okay, so this is sort of like a background here. So let's say that uh, Y, capital Y, is a random variable that depends on some unknown statistical parameters theta. So this is the notation we're going to be using. And so when Y is a continuous random variable, we think about it by its, um, its probability distribution, PY. And now we're going to explicitly write this um, given theta to denote the dependence of that PDF, that random variable, on those parameters theta. And typically when we think about these PDFs, what we visualize in our mind is a plot of this PDF versus Y. Um, so we usually think about it this way. And just as an example, let's say that I have a Gaussian random variable Y. Gaussian is characterized by two parameters, mu, the mean, and sigma squared, the variance. So um, <clears throat> we can view this PDF like this. This is something you guys have all seen before. It's this bell curve. Here you see that the, um, the center of it is at mu. And the width of this bell is going to be proportional to sigma the standard deviation or the square root of variance, right? Um, there's an equation for this. It's an important equation. You'll see it many times, so it's not a bad idea to memorize this. <clears throat> the main things we have going on here, we see that there's a quadratic difference from the mean. We see that that square difference gets um, scaled by essentially the inverse variance. And then that thing is inside a negative exponential. The negative in the exponential prevents this thing from going up you know, to infinity. Instead, it comes down to 0. The quadratic gives it this nice symmetry about its center. Um, the exponential part makes these tails decay really quickly. And the last part is this. This is just a scaling constant so that when you integrate this uh, PDF over Y, that it integrates to 1. That's, that's really the interpretation of that. It's just the number you need as a normalizing factor. Okay, So this is our bell curve. Um, this is just an example of what we're going to be dealing with. So we have here maybe a probabilistic model of our data, which is that it's Gaussian. And we see that that model depends on some unknown parameters, mu and sigma squared. And then maybe we want to estimate those parameters from data. So that's sort of a, an, an example. Um, everybody with me so far? OK, so let's bring the data into it. So in practice, as we've seen, we get a data set of, let's say, many copies of y. 
we label them y1 through yn, and we can stack them together into this boldface y vector. And we can imagine that these are independent samples of this random variable y with some PDF that depends on some parameters theta. Okay, so one way to think about this is imagine that each of these yi's, these guys, is a realization of a random variable y, capital Yi, and all those random variables are independent of each other, mutually independent, and they're all distributed identically to this original random variable Y. Okay, so that's maybe one of the clearest ways to think about it. So each of these guys here is the, a realization of a random variable capital Y. All the YIs are independent, and they're all distributed exactly like y is. Okay, so our job now is to estimate the parameters theta from this data that we've received. Okay, so because the data is independent, what can we assume, how can we rewrite this joint PDF? Here you see the joint PDF over all these n different random variables, capital YN. How can we rewrite this um, exploiting independence. So let me ask, is, um, is Vraj Patel here? Yeah. So what do you think, Vraj? Independence, what, just remember, what does independence say about random variables? How is it defined? If I have two random variables, y1 and y2, and I tell you they're independent, what does that mean about their joint PDF? No? It means that you can factor the joint PDF into a product of two individual PDFs. So in this case, we don't just have two. We have n copies. We can still do the same thing. We factor this into a product indexed over i. And now I'm going to have p capital Yi. That's the random variable, and now the dummy variable I'm going to use, I'm going to look at the ith entry in here, yi. But each of these guys are parameterized by the same thetas that, that are used here. Okay, so here I have a product of scalar PDFs, whereas on the left, I have what we call a joint PDF over all those n different random variables. Okay, is everybody good? And we can make one more simplification, which is just to remember that these yi's are all statistically identical to this y. So let's just rewrite this in terms of that original y. So here's the original y. Now we have the dummy variables yi and the parameters theta. Okay, so this is going to be the model that we see over and over and over again. We're always going to make this assumption. Whenever we get a bunch of data, we're going to assume that these are independent, identically dis distributed samples according to some distribution. <clears throat> okay, so here's the part that's perhaps most interesting, is that when we, when we look at this, this object, we want to think about this not as a function of y, the data, because the data is fixed. It's given to us. We don't consider any variations in it. What we consider now are variations in theta. Theta is what we have to figure out. That has a lot of possibilities. So now we think about this as a function of theta. And this is known as the likelihood function. Okay, so I want to contrast this with the previous page. Here, we've, we've thought about this PDF in the traditional way where you fix theta, and then you vary y, and you get this nice plot like here. Now, we're saying no. In this case, you fix y, and you visualize what happens as you vary theta. I'll show you an example on the next page. Okay? Um, and now, here is... The whole procedure, what we call maximum likelihood estimation, just says 
choose the parameters theta that maximize the likelihood of observing that set of data y. So you'd have this likelihood function. You just, for that fixed y, you figure out what are the thetas that make this the largest. Those are the most likely parameters given your observation. So that is maximum likelihood. So I'll put a little box around it. This is the whole idea. Okay, is that making sense? We'll see many examples of this, but that's, that's the idea in a nutshell. <coughs> Maximize the likelihood, the likelihood of getting that particular set of data points. <clears throat> okay, so because of the way that um, these probability distributions often manifest, it's very typical to see exponentials in these things. It's typical to have an exponential of minus something. For that reason, rather than looking at the probability itself, it's actually typical to look at the log probability. And it turns out that because the natural log is a monotonically increasing function, if you, maximize, if you find the maximizer of the natural log, of py given theta, that is the same thing as maximi finding the maximizer of the original. Okay, so <coughs> in other words, uh, one way to think about it is, is if you have, you know, let, let, let's say this is my likelihood, it has a peak there. When I take the natural log of the horizontal axis, what happens is this thing might get stretched out, but the location of that peak, where that peak is relative to the other, all the other points, has not changed. I have not reordered terms along the horizontal axis. I've just warped it. So that's why, essentially, we can sneak in the log here without changing anything. The other thing we can do, often to make our lives easier, instead of maximizing that, we minimize the negative log likelihood. Okay, so these are all equivalent. It's just that the last one ends up being the one that is usually most tractable to do derivations with. Okay, so that's, that's the whole reason we're doing this. Okay, any questions on we have here? Okay, so, um, so a comment that might not make sense now, but will make sense later, I think, is that when we do maximum likelihood estimation, we are not bringing in any prior beliefs about the parameters theta. We're not saying, oh, I think theta is like negative, or I think it's usually around 10. There's no, there's no beliefs at all about theta. Theta, you have completely un, un, uh, unpolluted it can be anything. Okay. <clears throat> All you're doing here is saying, based on the, the random variable y, that model, which are the thetas that maximize the likelihood of that y? Okay, so let me show you an example that hopefully will make this a, a, a little bit easy, easier to digest. So let's take a simpler case where we have a random variable y, and there's only one thing that we're trying to estimate is the mean. Let's say somehow we know that the variance is one, so that's not even gonna be considered a parameter. The only unknown parameter for us now is just the mean. So in other words, theta is just the mean mu. So this is the same equation that we saw on the previous page, but with sigma squared replaced by one, you can see it simplifies a little bit, and this is the unknown quantity mu. <clears throat> and um, so now, just for simplicity, let's say we have exactly two samples that we've collected, y1 and y2. That is our data, just two samples. And from those two samples, we want to fit mu, and we want to use this maximum likelihood approach. So here's, on the bottom of the page, an illustration you can see 
here's the y-axis horizontally, and here are my two samples. Y1 happens to be there, Y2 happens to be there. They both happen to be positive. They're not very big. So now our objective is to figure out how to do maximum likelihood estimation of mu from those two samples. Okay, so the likelihood in this case is probability of those two samples y given mu. Because we model them as independent, we know that this is the product over those two samples of py of the first times py of the second. And we can plug in the expression above for py, it looks like this. Okay, so this is the math problem. Maximize this over mu. That's essentially it. But here's a visualization of it. So let's, let's consider just for this visualization purpose three different hypotheses of what mu could be. Let's first consider is mu negative 1 or is mu 0.2 or is mu 1. In reality, mu can be any real number, but let's just make the, let's look at these three cases because we can draw a picture for each. Okay, so in the case that mu is negative 1, then what we would do is we would just, you know, plug in negative 1 here. And now we have some function. You know, we, we, have, we, can, we can draw this function. Actually, when mu is minus 1, we get this red curve. Okay, so the likelihood, the value of this, would be the red curve evaluated with y1, which has this height here times that same curve evaluated with y2, which has this height. In other words, it's this number times this number. That is the likelihood. <clears throat> now, what happens when mu is 0.2? In this case, this thing takes the form of the green curve. It's a bell curve centered at 0.2. And now, when I evaluate that at y1, I get this, this number here, and when I evaluate it at y2, I get that same number again. And the product of those two vertical numbers is the likelihood that mu is 0.2. So which of these two likelihoods is larger? Which of the two likelihoods is larger? Is likelihood for minus 1 or 0 0.2? 0 0.2 is much larger, right? Let's keep going. What if I went to mu equals, point one, mu equals 1? So now this thing takes the form of the blue curve, which is just a Gaussian centered at 1. And when I plug in those two values of y, I get those two numbers. I take their product, and that gives me the likelihood. So this time, the likelihood is, this is a lot larger than this, but it's still smaller than this. So using this, now you can just sort of imagine. Now you see the pattern. Imagine sliding around this curve from left to right. And you've, you have those two points that are moving up and down, right? What is the slide that's going to maximize the likelihood of all possible slides? One centered on the mean of the two samples. Yeah, the green one, right? Yeah. yeah, that's the one. So that is the maximum likelihood estimation. So that is just like a low dimensional toy example of what we're, what we're doing more generally. So in general, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this. Usually, we'll simplify this by taking a negative log. And then we'll, we'll just, um, we're looking for the, the minimum of that. So we just s compute the derivative and solve for the parameters that set the derivative to 0, which is the same thing we've been doing back since unit 1. Yes? Yeah, so in general, we have a vector of parameters. And so you would, in that case, you would have like a grid over a mu n sigma squared or sigma. And you would imagine it's harder to visualize, but you would have like some kind of shape. And as you, you know, and you have some data points on that grid. And so as you move that around, you're still measuring where you are on that shape and looking for the maximum. <coughs> Okay, so that, that is maximum likelihood estimation. Um, any other questions? Is this making sense? Everybody good? Any very important, 
I want to make sure everyone understands it. So, yeah. But what would be some real world applications? Like, what would we use this for? Um, I'll show you that that using the, applying this to a particular model gives us least squares estimation. Applying it, applying related things to other models gives us ridge regression and lasso. So essentially, you use this for pretty much everything in machine learning. This is this is like the the main procedure people use maximum likelihood. Uh, do we usually have reasons why why should follow a normal distribution? So the data model is going to be specific to the application. So um, we we just did this as a toy example. The normal distribution is is nice to work with, so it often shows up. In part because things happen in the real world that look Gaussian, but also in part because it's simple. And even when things are not Gaussian, people will do it just for tractability. Do you have a question? No, not necessarily. Th this is just one particular example with a Gaussian. So there's going to be other cases that look different than this for sure. <coughs> OK, great. Any other questions? OK, so, so now let's focus on linear regression, which is something we've been working on for pretty much the entire term. <clears throat> but now we have a new way of looking at it. So the question is, can we use maximum likelihood estimation to fit the parameters beta of linear regression? Obviously, the answer is yes. So we have to start with a statistical model, because this is all based on some assumed probability distribution, right? So this is where we have to start with some random variable model. In this case, the model we're going to use is y equals the x matrix times the beta vector plus some noise vector. And in this case, the, um, well, actually, sorry, we're going to call that not w, but epsilon. In this case, when we look at the individual epsilons, so epsilon i, these guys are distributed IID, which means <clears throat> independent, identically distributed, Gaussian, zero mean, with some variance sigma squared. Okay, this is called the linear Gaussian model. So it's linear in how the betas affect things, and it's Gaussian because there's this noise, or you could say modeling error, the difference between the targets and the linear model is assumed here to be Gaussian zero mean with some variance. So this is this is exactly what we used in our polynomial demo, if you remember. Um, in that case, the features happen to be just polynomial versions of a you know common scalar feature. Another comment is notice that we are not trying to fit beta zero. We did not put a ones vector on the left side of this matrix because we're assuming here that we're doing standardized data. This is really just for notational simplicity. We're assuming standardized data, so we're not trying to fit that. Everything would hold even if we did want to fit that term. Nothing would change. But this allows us to write things um, similar to how we did with ridge regression in last Okay, so this is the model we're assuming. And so if I think about the ith entry in this vector, y, call that yi, that's going to be the ith row in x, so we'll call that boldface xi, transpose times the beta vector. Right, so we have a scalar here. It's a row vector times a column vector plus a scalar noise term epsilon i. And so here's a really important step um, <clears throat> in terms of understanding. So let's take a look at this, close look at this thing right here. We want to make a random variable model out of this. In other words, we want to write what is the probability of yi given my training features x and my parameters beta. So 
Notice that we're conditioning on x and beta. So this term, xi transpose beta, is this random? No, right? It's just a fixed constant. I know what it is. Then I have this Gaussian noise that's zero mean. What if I think of the sum? Can I think of that <coughs> as a Gaussian with a particular mean? What would the mean be of this? This would be the mean of this whole thing. And that whole thing, that y, I can think of as Gaussian, right? At least y conditional on knowing that, we can think of as Gaussian. And so here it is. I have a Gaussian, a normal dist distribution. Yi is a dummy variable. The mean is xi transpose beta, this part. And the variance is inherited from here. It has the same amount of variation whether or not I add this constant shift. That's sigma squared. Okay, so we, we will do something like this very often. We'll often think about the, th the stuff we know as a shift of the noise variable that allows us to draw this or write this PDF of y with this particular mean sum, you know, variance term here. Okay, so this is a key step, comes up over and over and over again. So I want to make sure everybody's okay with this step. Is this step making sense? Okay, great. So, um, <clears throat> so we're ready to move on then. So now we know that these different noise terms are independent of each other. And that means that these yi terms are independent conditional on knowing x and beta. <coughs> so that means that this joint distribution, this is the, the probability distribution of all the different y's, can be written as a product of the probability distributions individually for each of the y's. Okay, so this is independence allows us to do this. Moreover, when I look at yi, I don't actually need to know all the different rows in x, this x matrix. The only row which affects yi is the ith row in x, this one. Okay, so now that I know that this is this Gaussian, I can plug in my Gaussian equation here. So this is what we saw a couple slides ago, except instead of the mean mu, I have this very particular mean that is xi transpose beta. Okay, so that's next step. Everybody good at that step? Okay, and the rest is just sort of massaging this to make it look a little bit nicer. Okay, so first of all, we have a product here, n, n times of this. So I can just take this to the nth power, and I can write this like this. Here I have n over 2 in the denominator instead of the power 1 half. Okay, that essentially moves this product forward. Now I can look at a product of exponentials. But let's look at this. If I have something like e to the power a times e to the power b, what's another way to write that? It's a little bit more elegant. E to the a plus b. E to the a plus b, exactly. So when you have a product of exponentials, that's equivalent to the exponential of the sum of the products. So here I have a product of these exponentials, but I can just essentially move that product into the, inside the exponential, but then think about it as a sum. So now I'm going to have a sum over i of this stuff, and I can move that sum through that first term and put it there. Okay, so that's, that's how we did this. Product of exponentials is the exponential of the sum, and then I just have a sum of those quadratic terms. Everybody good at that step? Okay, the very last step is to recognize that we have a slightly nicer way of writing this. This is just the squared norm of y minus x times beta. We've seen this a few times. So now we just have a concise expression for the likelihood of y given x and beta. Okay, so a lot of your homework problems, 
exam problems and so on will look very much like this. It's something to get used to seeing, practicing. <clears throat> so we're almost done. Are there any questions about how we got here? Okay, almost done. So um, <clears throat> what we have to do next is, like I mentioned a few times, it often simplifies if we look at the negative log of this thing. Let's first consider the log. So what happens if I take the log of this? So what, if, what happens if I take the log of A divided by B? Log A minus log B. So when I take the log of this, I get the log of the numerator, and immediately that log just cancels with the exponential, and I have this, and then I have minus the log of the denominator. Okay, but my goal is to minimize over beta. So I'm going to have this log of this thing down here, which doesn't depend on beta, so does that affect this minimization at all? Is it just like a constant shift? It doesn't affect it. So essentially, I can ignore this. It doesn't affect this minimization. I can focus on the numerator. And as we said, the log took out the exponential. Now this minus sign will take out that. <clears throat> and so we get argmin of beta of 1 over 2 sigma squared y minus x beta uh, norm squared. Is everybody good with that? We can simplify it even a little bit more. Anybody see how we can simplify this a little bit more? What can we remove? Yeah, because since we're trying to find the largest beta, this, this scaling doesn't affect which beta is largest. So this is also argmin beta. I'm um, sorry, I should try to shrink this. Argument of beta of just, oops, y minus x beta norm squared. And what have we discovered here? The maximum likelihood estimate is this. This is something you've seen before, right? What do we, what do we call this? This is our least squares estimation, right? This is our linear regression. This is what we did back in Unit 2. Back in Unit 2, we did it in a very heuristic way. We said, without any really defense of it, let's just minimize the sum of the squares. Okay. So in some cases, that is a good idea. In some cases, it turns out that that's actually a very bad idea. It will work terribly. With maximum likelihood, we have some understanding now of when it might work well. Do you see when it might work well? When the noise is, when the noise is Gaussian. Because when the noise is Gaussian, this whole procedure is not heuristic. It has this sort of credibility. This is the official maximum likelihood estimate, which is this thing people love. They, they studied it in all these ways. They can prove all these optimal statistical behaviors of it. Um, and so it says, yes, when you have Gaussian noise, least squares estimation is a wonderful thing to do. It's, in fact, optimal. <clears throat> However, if I give you a data set where this noise is what's called heavy-tailed, um, if it has outliers, if it has once in a while a gigantic value, and you apply least squares estimation to it, the result will be terrible. And now we understand why that is, because that particular noise model is very different than this. You could do maximum likelihood estimation for some of those noise models, and you would get a different procedure that would actually work a lot better. You know, so what, what works well in general is maximum likelihood. Now you have to figure out what is the statistical model that matches your data. You know, hopefully you have maybe some, some knowledge, or maybe you try different ones and you use cross-validation. You have to be able to figure that out somehow. Okay, was there a question? Did you have a question? Okay, great. Okay, so maximum likelihood is 
is a fantastic procedure. It's pretty much what we're going to be using all throughout the, the term now, except for a few special cases, which, um, which actually we'll talk about next. Okay, any questions about maximum likelihood? So we will definitely see it again. We'll get more practice with it. If you don't feel like you've mastered it so far, that's absolutely fine. <clears throat> we have this other approach, map estimation. So map estimation, in some sense, makes more sense. Um, it goes like this. It's the arg max, or the maximizer over beta of the probability of beta given the things we know, x and y. Right? It, or, yeah. If, if you step back and think about it, this actually, in some sense, makes more sense. You're saying, like, okay, I'm thinking of, you know, all these different possibilities of beta. Why don't I just pick the most probable beta? That's what we're saying here. What's the most probable beta given the things I have observed? I have these features. I have these targets. What's the most probable beta? Okay, but there's a catch. When you write things this way, you are implicitly treating beta, or actually, sorry, I meant to write, yeah, I am writing beta here. We are treating beta as a random variable. Whereas before, we never really thought of beta as random. Beta was just a set of numbers. We could tweak as we like. Now we're saying all of a sudden, wait a minute, beta is a random <coughs> variable. That means I have to know some probability distribution on beta. Okay, that's the difference, but well, let's see how this goes. So this, this thing here, it's hard to untangle. We don't know what that thing is. We have to figure this out. And we can appeal to something called Bayes rule. Let me show you the simpler approach to Bayes rule. Bayes rule is basically a nice thing to use if you want to swap conditioning. So if you say, I have, let's say, two random variables, A and B. If you want to know... How do I write probability A given B um, when maybe I know probability B given A, but I don't know A given B? So here's how you can change the order. You get B given A times probability of A divided by probability of B. So in, if this is hard to deal with, maybe you can reverse it. Maybe you know this, this, and this, in which case you're good to go. It's tractable. So that's what we're going to apply right here. It's going to be just slightly more opaque because all the while when we do this, we're going to treat, we're going to condition on x. The whole time we're going to condition on x. So <clears throat> it goes like this. We're going to have probability of y given beta and x times probability of beta given x divided by probability y given x. Okay, so in other words, what we did is we're just, we're just always conditioning on this extra thing here. That's, that's the only difference between these two versions. So X is just always this thing we know, so we always keep it around as something we condition on. <clears throat> but notice that now that we've written it this way, what is this? We've seen this before. What do we call this? We have a name for this. This is the likelihood. Okay? So, like, for, for this model here, we knew exactly, you know, we derived this. This is our likelihood. So likelihood is usually something that's not too difficult to obtain in most cases. Then we have this thing. Okay, probability of beta given x. Probability of the parameters given the features. So in most cases, you think of the parameters as not dependent on the features themselves. You just think about the parameters as statistically independent of the features. And so that allows you to drop the conditioning on that second term. So you get probability y given beta comma x times probability of beta 
and then in the numerator, probability of y given x. Okay. So here, in doing this, we're, we're saying that um, my prior belief on these parameters beta, by prior, what I mean is prior before I ever saw any data whatsoever, should not depend on the data I have not seen yet. So that's why it makes sense to just think about my prior belief as just something <coughs> independent of the feature data. <coughs> okay. Now that we have this, we can plug this expression into our map expression, and this is our map estimate is the beta that maximizes this. <clears throat> How can we simplify this a little bit? Do you see what, what happens with this denominator? Since I'm maximizing over beta, denominator doesn't have any effect, right? It's just this constant scaling. <clears throat> so another way to do it is, another way to think about it, is just like we did for um, maximum likelihood, instead of maximizing this directly, we can maximize the, um, well, okay, we'll, we'll do that next. Let, okay, so what I'm gonna do is just basically, oops, we're gonna get rid of the, get rid of the denominator because it doesn't affect the maximization. Okay, <clears throat> so these are the two terms, the likelihood is what we saw before. This measures how well beta agrees with the data we've collected. This other term, the prior, measures or models how well beta agrees with our prior belief about beta. For example, I might say, I know beta is positive, or I know beta should be not too far from zero, or maybe it should be not too far from 10. You know, there's all these things, maybe you have domain knowledge you can incorporate that's what, that's what you use for this. <clears throat> it's just another approach. Some applications you might say, I don't want to assume anything about beta. That would, you know, I'm doing science. I don't want to make assumptions about what I'm testing. Otherwise, if, if I make assumptions, then I'm invalidating my experiments. But in other cases, if you're doing digital communications, you say, I know my bits are zero and one, and I know they're equally likely to be zero and one. Why would I not use that in designing my system? So there's applications where you can have very strong priors and other ones where you don't want to have strong priors. In any case, this is another approach to doing statistical parameter estimation, MAP. And the main thing is that maximum likelihood uses only this part, but MAP uses that and the prior, uses both likelihood and prior. So that's the, that's the key difference between maximum likelihood and MAP. MAP uses prior information, maximum likelihood does not. <clears throat> it's not that one or the other is better, they're just different approaches. <clears throat> okay, any questions on this slide? Okay, let's now, let's take a look at this map estimation and show you that, in fact, this explains ridge regression and lasso. So this is what we have from the previous page. Let's maximize the product of the likelihood and the prior. Just like we did with maximum likelihood, we can also minimize the negative log of that same product. And if I take the negative log of that product, I get minus the log likelihood minus the log prior. And often this is in a much more tractable form than this original one. So let's look at an example. Come back to our linear Gaussian model that we saw on the previous page. We already derived the fact that the log likelihood gives us, if the log likelihood gives us one over two sigma squared y minus x times beta norm squared plus a constant that does not depend on beta. That was the, um, that was the negative log of, of this term here. 
since I'm writing an equality, I have to include it. <clears throat> okay, so we derived that before. So now what we have for beta map is going to be arg min over beta of this first term the norm squared minus the second term, which is the log p beta So this is, this is one way to do it. Another way to write it is to multiply that entire expression by 2 sigma. <coughs> in which case, you get the 2 sigma appears over here. And if you write it this way, it's interpretable. The first term is nothing more than the RSS. And the second term is, we call this plus phi of beta. This was the regularization term that we introduced when we were looking for ways to do model order selection. And we said we have this regularization approach that takes the RSS, but then adds some other penalty term onto it. In that context, the penalty term was maybe hopefully doing some sort of um, feature selection, but it doesn't have to do that. You know, we saw with Ridge that what it actually does, it actually helps with correlation. Um, but in any case, you know, we can have an arbitrary penalty here that somehow penalizes some aspect about beta. In this case, what it's doing is it's penalizing any differences from our prior belief. We have some prior belief. We have um, encoded that into a, a probability distribution on beta. And this is basically saying, when you, you know, when you do this map estimation, it needs to fit your data. It also needs to fit your prior belief. And as it starts to go away from your prior belief, this penalty term will get larger and larger. Okay, so this is doing both, fitting data, fitting your prior. Okay, so here we have regularized linear regression. This is exactly what we saw before. Now we understand that this is really map estimation. <coughs> the only thing left to figure out is how does this phi manifest? Maybe we can reverse engineer ridge. So for ridge, that corresponds to some prior belief about beta. Lasso corresponds to some other prior belief about beta, some probability distribution. What are those probability distributions? We can reverse engineer this. Any questions on this page? OK, so let's, let's take a look at first ridge, then lasso. So this is what we have from the previous page. We have our RSS. We have the second term, which we think of as our penalty. Um, we're minimizing this over beta. That gives us our map solution. <clears throat> so imagine that our prior belief on beta is that beta those coefficients are random variables that are normal or Gaussian, zero mean, and some variance v. So if that's the case, this is the expression for the joint probability distribution of all the different betas. So here we're going to assume that they're independent, identically distributed. So we have a product of identical terms. Each one, so this is a product over j. Each term contains a beta j. You can see there's zero mean. There's nothing subtracting from beta in that square term. And you can see the variance manifests here, v. OK, so this is the prior belief. So here I actually want to look at the log prior. So when I take the log of this, well, the first thing that happens is I take the log of a product, which we said essentially you can think of that now as a sum, and then the log is on this side. Then we take the log of this fraction, 
The numerator, the log cancels with this, and we get this. The denominator, you get log of this, which is not a function of beta, so it's a constant. So the log of beta is this. And so essentially, this is what we want to plug in here. The twos cancel, and this is what we get. The map estimate is RSS plus this scaled two norm. And this is exactly what we had for ridge regression, but we call that alpha. So now we actually can interpret alpha using two things. How strong is the noise on the measurements, sigma squared, versus how confident are we that the betas are close to zero, right? Because the smaller this variance is, it's like we're more and more sure that the betas are close to zero. So that ratio between our noise variance and our beta variance, that is the alpha of ridge regression. So as we increase alpha, that's like making V smaller. It's like saying I'm more and more sure that my beta should be close to zero before I ever see any, any data. Okay, so ridge regression or map. Ridge regression is one instance of map estimation. Okay. Is that part pretty clear? Any, any questions on how we got there? Okay. So then we have another case. What if we believe that betas are IID Laplacian? So Laplace, the Laplace distribution looks more like this. It's peaked in the middle. It, so a bell curve is rounded on top. This one is peaked on top. Also, um, in the Gaussian case, In the Gaussian case here, these guys decay very quickly because there's exponential of a squared term on the deviation. In the Laplacian case, that square is missing. You have exponential of a negative absolute value. So these decay not as quickly. So essentially, Laplacian um, allows the data to have these large values once in a while, whereas Gaussian says no, that would be very, very improbable. So this is the, yeah, this is the, the distribution of a Laplacian with a shift parameter zero and a scale parameter of lambda. And here again, we're assuming IID, so we have a product, all the beta j's have the same PDF. So now when I look at the log of this prior, I take the log of this product that turns into a sum. Then the log is over here. The log cancels with the exponential. Now we have a sum of these terms. We know that a sum of absolute values is the L1 norm. And then we have another term, a constant, which doesn't depend on beta. So I plug this in here and we get this, which looks exactly like the lasso regularization for a very particular value of alpha, which is 2 sigma squared over lambda. Okay. So it's this peak here. That's what gives um, lasso the desire to set coefficients exactly to zero, whereas when this is a rounded top, like in ridge, it doesn't really care if they're zero or a little bit away from zero. Here, really wants them to be zero. It also allows larger values, uh, whereas in ridge, it really does not want the values to get large because the Gaussian tails decay much quicker than the Laplacian tails. Okay, so basically we have, just to summarize, if your prior belief is IID Gaussian, you get ridge regression when you do MAP. If your prior belief is IID Laplacian, MAP gives you lasso. So now we have ways of understanding all these heuristic techniques that we came up with from a more uh, pure statistical viewpoint. And this is going to be able to, this is going to allow us to generalize to different models that we will express probabilistically, especially when we get to classification, which is in the next unit. Okay, so just to summarize, um, the last, last slide, supervised machine learning can be framed as statistical parameter estimation. The way we do this is we come up with some probabilistic model of our targets, given our features, and the learnable parameters. 
in our machine learning system. <clears throat> and then what we do is we fit those parameters theta using the framework of maximum likelihood where we maximize this likelihood function. Equivalently, we can minimize over theta the negative log likelihood. It's the same thing, it's just sometimes that that gives you a more tractable expression. We have another approach that's appropriate if you have some sort of belief about <clears throat> the parameters themselves. You can use this uh, in the map case, and then you get the negative log likelihood, but then you also have a negative log prior on theta. And this is very commonly used throughout machine learning, the idea of regularization, of bringing in something to help this <coughs> loss somehow. Some sort of extra information that you know that, um, or that you postulate that's gonna make things better. So, in fact, in, in some sense, um, equally important in terms of coming up with some fancy machine learning model, whether it's a neural network or whatever it is, is coming up with a really good loss function, something that you ask your optimizer to minimize that really gets the job done. I would say more than half the engineering is actually coming up with, with these terms often, or as much as the architecture of your, your predictor. Okay, so that's, that's all we have. Um, everything else here we covered last time, and so that that concludes this unit. Um, good timing. On Wednesday, we'll get started with classification. Are there any remaining questions from today's lecture? Okay, great. See you guys on Wednesday.